So a warm welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us today uh, for this very exciting webinar to uh, launch the Global Wind Energy Council Global Offshore Wind Report 2022. Uh, this is one of GWEC's flagship reports coming hot on the heels of our Global Wind Report 2022, which covers both onshore and offshore wind published earlier this year. And we're very excited to bring this special offshore wind uh, focus to, to our audience today. Um, it's especially exciting because we are launching this uh, on the occasion of the UN Ocean Conference being hosted by Portugal and Kenya in Lisbon this week. And we have many team members, colleagues from GWEC, as well as panelists who have dialed in uh, live from Lisbon uh, to join us for this, this launch event. So we're, we're really excited to bring some um, great discussion to you, some, some really interesting presentation and, and data points about offshore wind uh, in just a second. Um, just a note about what we'll be covering today. The theme of this year's report is offshore wind, the next horizon of growth. And we'll be looking ahead at the requirements, the challenges ahead, uh, and the demands that uh, we um, the, the demands for offshore wind to really scale up and deliver uh, sustainable supply chain, deliver large scale volumes of clean power in line with net zero and 1.5 degree milestones um, by 2050. One uh, thing that we'll definitely be touching on is pace of growth uh, of offshore wind during this webinar. So we'll take a look at some of the um, market status data around the world, as well as the market forecast data out to uh, 2031. And this will show um, a, a general trend that growth is happening um, fairly slowly in comparison to the net zero trajectory uh, that we need to be seeing within this decade. And we'll also be touching on issues like sustainability, offshore winds uh, interface and, and interaction with the marine environment and biodiversity concerns, uh, supply chain health um, in, in the current global context of uh, cost inflation and commodity price raises, consenting, market design, and much, much more. So thank you so much for tuning in with us. And uh, we hope that you can stay for, for the full uh, one hour and 15 minute event to dive into all these issues. Um, in just a second, I'm going to hand it to the GWEC CEO, Ben Backwell, to provide some opening remarks, but I'll briefly make some um, housekeeping notes first. Uh, so please do uh, use the Q&A function during this webinar. If any comments, observations, questions come up, then we really welcome uh, you to provide your question uh, using the Q&A uh, button in the Zoom ribbon at any point during the webinar. We'll be sure to pick this up during the 45 minute um, panel discussion uh, portion of this webinar. If you have any issues regarding um, technical issues, difficulty getting audio or, or seeing the, the screen share, uh, then please reach out to GWEC Communications, uh, the host of this webinar, and we'll be sure to contact you directly to try to troubleshoot. Um, so I'll do a brief rundown of the agenda and then I'll hand it to Ben for his opening remarks. We're going to start with some opening remarks. Um, from Ben, as well as from um, Ulrich Striedbeck uh, from Orsted. Then we'll have presentations from uh, Feng Zhao, as well as Rebecca Williams of GWEC to look at both the data side and the story side of the report. And then as mentioned, we'll have a 45 minute panel discussion and we're joined by uh, a star-studded panel today um, from all corners of the offshore wind industry, including Orsted, Crew, UN Global Compact on issues around climate, uh, climate smart MSP and biodiversity protection, as well as Rebecca, uh, one of the lead authors of this report. And just a note on uh, a note of appreciation as well, if you can go to the next slide. For the sponsors that made this report possible, so a big note of thanks for our leading sponsor, Orsted, for making this report uh, a reality, uh, our supporting sponsors, Crew and Lincoln Electric, and finally, our associate sponsors this year, Harding, Bonfilioli, as well as SSE Renewables. Uh, we're deeply grateful to each of these companies um, for their time and effort and resources in supporting uh, this great document that we've released this week. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben to provide some opening remarks for this webinar. Ben, the floor is yours. Great, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Ben Backwell. I'm joining you from sunny uh, Lisbon where I've been attending the UN 
Oceans Conference and have spent the last few days talking to a wide uh, group of, of people uh, working around oceans and ocean conservation, uh, also looking at the blue economy and, and, um, and energy um, in the oceans as well. And it's really been um, a very interesting and eye-opening um, experience. Um, I'd like to highlight really just a couple of things in this uh, Global Wind Energy Council um, Global Offshore Wind Report 2022. I mean, the first is that the offshore wind industry had a record year. In fact, we've had two um, you know, consecutive, uh, you know, very, very strong years. We are growing at a brisk uh, rate. Um, we reached uh, 21 uh, gigawatts of, of insula insulations. Uh, we now have something over 55 uh, gigawatts of cumulative insulation. So a pretty big uh, jump uh, this year. Um, and I think probably even more important than that has been the jump in ambition this year. So you can really see now that the 380 gigawatts by 2030, which GWEC and IRENA put forward as our um, UN Global Compact uh, last year as a target um, is starting to look more realistic in terms of ambition. And that's really due to some just very big and growing commitments over the last year, um, part of which, um, which have come uh, because of the impact of the energy crisis and the invasion of, of the Ukraine. Um, you could highlight um, the European Union's you know, ever rising ambition now targeting 75 gigawatts by 2030. Um, you can see the UK now promising 50 gigawatts by 2030, but also looking at new markets with very ambitious targets, such as Japan with its vision, uh, offshore wind vision of 45 uh, gigawatts uh, by 2040, the um, very ambitious numbers which are in Vietnam's uh, PDP-8 and so on and so on. That takes us to at least a level of ambition which is starting to be in keeping with where we need to go to reach uh, net zero. Um, however, you know, the implementation gap as identified in the report is a you know, very um, you know, serious um, and, and, and key um, aspect of, of everything that's, that's gonna happen in the next few years. We need to now make this a reality. We need to go out and build um, and regulation um, and permitting and everything around offshore wind, the frameworks simply aren't there in a way that would allow us to grow um, in, in, on this trajectory. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done now with governments and with stakeholders uh, to prepare the right framework so that we can go forward. Um, everything simply is too slow and the leasing of seabeds in order to build these projects um, is not in keeping with the trajectory and the ambition uh, that we can see here. So, you know, something needs to happen to, to speed up uh, seabed leasing and, 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 and create everything around um, uh, offshore wind that, that's necessary uh, to build here. Um, and I'd mention also, as, as Joyce has, the, you know, the need for a sustainable su supply chain, which can scale up uh, to this very large uh, uptick, uptick in growth that we're going to see in the next 10 years. Um, that brings me to the next uh, issue and also why we're here in Lisbon. Now, this is the first time that we've intervened you know, on such a scale um, in a, a large um, oceans conference rather than something around energy or, or climate. And, and the reason for this is that as we build our industry, we're, we're, we're building out into the ocean and we're building out into a space which is occupied by others, be they um, creatures, uh, mammals, sea life, also people using the ocean in different ways. Um, and we have an enormous responsibility to be good custodians of the ocean space. And indeed, I'd argue to, rather than just not making things worse in a very fragile ocean environment, to actually try and make things better as an industry. That's why we come here today uh, Rebecca Williams and myself and others to to listen to engage with people to really understand the interests and the concerns of others and there's indeed a whole chapter in this year's report which is dedicated to uh, sustainability and, and issues around biodiversity and, and, and other related themes. Um, this 
how we relate to the wider ocean space is going to be a key um, issue um, and challenge for our industry because without um, doing this in the right way we simply are not going to be able to build we won't have the social license to go and build and we won't have the support and the cooperation of other stakeholders um, we've been working um, with um, uh, Martha and UNGC um, as, as you'll hear later on from from her um, uh, uh, around the question of marine spatial planning and marine spatial planning is really a key nexus uh, where this conversation around building out capacity but also around um, biodiversity and preserving um, the oceans is, is going to play out. And so we're very interested in, in, in extending and, and um, enhancing this conversation as we go on. So um, it's really a fantastic and exciting time to be in the offshore wind industry. Um, there are absolutely unique challenges ahead, which are, are completely new uh, um, and unprecedented. But at GWEC, and I know as the whole industry, we're really looking forward to engaging around those challenges and finding the creative solutions uh, to find this new era of growth um, that we have identified in this year's uh, report. So thank you, everyone, and particularly thanks uh, to the whole team uh, that um, produced uh, the report at GWEC um, and, and the lead authors, Rebecca Williams, uh, Feng Zhao, and Joyce Lee. Um, thanks for the whole team um, and also thanks to our uh, sponsors who not only sponsored the report but also engaged in the content and really helped us to get this report uh, uh, right and also thanks to uh, UNGC that um, really helped um, facilitate and, and um, arrange our, our intervention here in Lisbon as well so thanks everyone and uh, enjoy the event. Great thank you so much Ben for those opening remarks I think uh, an excellent way to set the scene for the discussion ahead. Uh, we'll now turn to some remarks from our lead sponsor, Orsted, and they'll be delivered by Ulrich Striedbeck, who's the Vice President and Head of Regulatory Affairs at Orsted. Hello, I'm Ulrich Striedbeck uh, from Orsted, uh, the global leading offshore wind developer. Thank you for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Uh, we are very happy to, to look at the report from GWEC and we see certainly uh, an offshore wind industry uh, that has uh, matured uh, to a degree that it has now become a centerpiece of uh, the affordable and clean energy solutions that many countries uh, uh, see that they need. So very, very uh, positive and good ambition levels are rising. However, at the same time, uh, we are also looking back at a year where the, the rebound after COVID, the, uh, the disruptions that COVID caused, and lately also the unwarranted uh, invasion by Russia to, to the Ukraine, triggering an energy crisis, has also put the industry, like many other sectors in the economy, at, at a crunch time. So uh, we will need to focus on how to turn uh, ambition into action to trigger the necessary investments uh, to, to, to create an offshore wind sector uh, that uh, we have uh, planned and that we have ambitions uh, to do. We see uh, three main points uh, to achieve that, uh, that we will uh, hope to look back at with, with good eyes, uh, with, positive, uh, with positive results in a year's time. Number one, we will have to turn uh, uh, ambition into action by creating the regulatory frameworks, by creating the solutions, political uh, uh, solutions that are needed to, to, to hand out the sites, to give them to, to the market to develop. That's number one. Number two, we will also have to continue our innovation journey in finding ways to, for offshore wind to coexist uh, with, uh, with the nature, with uh, other economic activities, with society at large. We will have to continue to innovate on sustainability, on uh, biodiversity that we'll have to have. We will have to have innovative solutions on how to integrate offshore wind into the uh, broader electricity system. That will have to continue. And number three, we are looking uh, 
very much because of the disruptions uh, uh, that, that are happening right now, we are actually looking into a supply chain that is simply not there and ready to deliver uh, on these ambitions. The supply chains uh, are, are struggling, uh, they are loss making, they are not finding uh, a way to make those investments that they need to build new factories, uh, to build new ships, to, to, to increase and expand their capacity. So number three, we will really have to, as soon as possible, to create much greater clarity for the supply chain to, to trigger the uh, investments that they need to plan uh, ahead and, 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 uh, and be there uh, as, as the offshore wind sector uh, develops. We have very high hopes for that. Uh, GWEC is a very uh, good uh, convening force for the industry to speak uh, uh, with, with a, a unified voice to develop the positionings to be in dialogue with governments to solve these solutions. And we have high hopes that the GWEC can continue to play that role and that the report next year from GWEC will start to show some of the proof in the pudding on these key challenges that we see. Thank you very much for having me. Great. So thank you to Ulrich and Orsted for those uh, fantastic opening remarks. I think we're seeing a clear theme of turning ambition into action emerge today, and, and that will come through in the presentations very shortly. So with this, I, I would like to hand it to uh, one of the lead authors of the report, Feng Zhao, who's the head of market intelligence and strategy here at GWEC, and he'll be walking us through the data side of this year's Global Offshore Wind Report. Feng, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joyce. Um, thank you for the entire team, uh, both internally and also uh, the sponsor to uh, give us the help and also with the case study. And uh, on behalf of the content team, I'm going to first present the key findings from the data. This next slide, uh, as we already uh, presented uh, in our Global Wind Report released in the about uh, the Wind Energy uh, Conference in Europe. 2021 is a fantastic year. The next slides indicate that in a single year, we have more than 21 gigawatt installed. Ben already highlighted uh, in the opening remarks. I think the big driver is mainly due to China. And uh, there is a cut off in terms of fitting tariff by the end of 2021. Therefore, we, we saw tremendous growth in that market. Similar situation also record in Vietnam due to the uh, cutoff of fitting tariffs. By the end of October 2021, we saw more than one gigawatt installed. And uh, in our report, we report nearly 800 megawatt reached the COD. In Asia Pacific, we also uh, record installation in Taiwan. Uh, unfortunately, we only have 109 gigawatt, uh, megawatt installed. It's supposed to be like one gigawatt, but due to the COVID-19 impact, we only record uh, slightly over 100 in that region. Uh, looking at Europe, uh, we have more than three gigawatt installed, and the majority of the installation from the UK, uh, followed by Denmark, and the Netherlands, and also one floating turbine in Norway. Um, looking at somewhere else outside Europe and China, we don't have any um, project installed, for example, in North America last year. Again, last year, it's an uh, unusual but outstanding uh, year for the global offshore uh, wind industry. Um, based on what has been going on um, this sea, first of all, uh, as also mentioned in our global wind report, I think at the COP26 Glasgow uh, Climate Change Conference, I think, um, commitment to reach net zero has already carried the global momento, which already put when in the position to play a vital role in terms of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. And the start from the beginning of this year due to the war between Russia and Ukraine, it's bring a lot of things uh, onto the table. The primary, I think, uh, impact that's regarding the Energy concern, uh, security concern. Let's take a look uh, how we see uh, how 
did we uh, make the, the update for the 2031 outlook? That's the 10 years outlook. Uh, next slide, please. So next, um, before we looking at the growth trend, I just want to highlight here the methodology. Uh, we present 10 years outlook uh, in our global offering report and the five years outlook for both Android and Alfio in our uh, global wind report normally released in the end of Q1 uh, each year. So for this 10 years global offshore wind outlook, for the first five years, we strictly follow the perch pipeline we have identified across global no matter matured or emerging market. But for the next five years uh, uh, in the 10 years outlook, we do take into account the declared uh, offshore wind target and also we bring in the meter target across the global into the consideration. So that's why we believe that and the more record breaking year are going to happen, start from 2025. Looking at the growth chart, we can see with the compound as a cargo uh, of 6.3 percent until 2026 and 13.9 percent um, cargo up to the end of um, the beginning of next decade, we can see and uh, we believe that the new installation are going to grow tremendously, where we can see um, probably the annual installation are going to more than double from today's last year, 21 gigawatt into 40, uh, into 54.9 gigawatt in 2031. It's going to bring the share of global new installation from 23% in 2021 to 32% by 2031. Uh, in terms of the total addition, uh, we believe that more than 315 gigawatts are going to be built in the next 10 years from 2022 to 2031, bring the total offshore wind installation to 370 gigawatt. That's the data point Ben already mentioned in the opening remark. It's quite close to GY Arena uh, proposed the target uh, from this UN Global Compact for net zero uh, pathway. Um, however, uh, we believe that um, only one less than one quarter, one third of the installation will be achieved in the first five years. Majority of the installation will be built in it next five years. So again, for this uh, growth trend, it uh, really depends on many work that already highlighted by the VP uh, from Eurek uh, at the Oster. Now let's take a look um, another growth. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we believe that the market will become more diversified um, looking at the growth in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, the bar chart indicates the installation per region. Uh, you can see all the key market uh, in each region. Uh, the, the bar chart indicates that uh, the market will becoming more diversified start from uh, 2026. And by 2031, you can see that and more information are going to be built uh, in emerging market. Uh, out of this 315 um, gigawatt new installation expect to be built in the next 10 years, uh, we believe that 88% uh, will come from Europe and Asia, followed by North America, Pacific, and also North America. And Europe and China so far made up nearly 97% uh, of offshore installation. Um, but this situation, we believe that it's going to change. Uh, the global market share uh, for these two regions, we believe that are, are going to drop to 84% in 2026. By 2031, their market share together will drop to 80%. There's many primary reasons for this is mainly due to we expect more growth are going to from emerging market in Southeast Asia and also America, including North America, United States, and also South America, including Brazil, Costa Rica, Mexico, et cetera. Um, being through the global outlook for both 
fix the bottom and the floating when not. Let's take a look uh, our update for this year's floating market outlook. Next slide, please. Um, for some of you who are familiar with the outlook we presented a year ago, uh, at that time, we believe that uh, 16.5 gigawatt floating wind are going to be built by 2030. However, uh, follow what has been going on uh, in the past uh, 10 months. We saw uh, the UK, for example, increase floating target from one gigawatt to five by 2030. And across the global, I think the floating wind associate activity accelerate in different regions, including Europe, uh, Asia, uh, also, uh, North America, uh, based on GYC Global Option One Project Pipeline, we put together nearly 120 gigawatt uh, floating pipeline across the global. Uh, for this reason, uh, we have upgraded our 2030 global floating option one forecast from 16.5 gigawatt to 18.9 gigawatt in this year's report. And we believe that 11 gigawatt out of this 18.9 gigawatt floating forecast will come from Europe. 5.5 gigawatt will come from Asia. The rest will come from North America, mainly from the east, uh, from the west coast of uh, United States. Uh, in many in California, for example, uh, the Boeing are going to launch the seabed leasing in Morro Bay and Humboldt Bay area in Q4 this year. We be with that. Um, floating wind activity are going to accelerate uh, once the CBIT leasing uh, is launching uh, in United States. Uh, looking at the uh, those uh, floating leading market, uh, by the end of 2021, we have the UK, Portugal, Japan, Norway, and China are the top five market in terms of total floating wind installation. Um, by the end of 2030, we believe that the top five leading uh, market are going to change. Uh, the UK will remain a number one, but South Korea are going to become a number two market. United States, considering what has been going on and how big the potential in the West Coast of the United States would be that uh, the US potentially could become number three market in terms of floating wind, followed by Spain and Ireland. And Ireland is a market already uh, covered in our GWAC floating uh, wind market, uh, if you would would like to know more detail, you can get uh, uh, the country profile from our floating wind report. Um, so those are uh, highlight from the data side in this new report. Again, uh, we saw quite uh, optimistic uh, outlook, uh, mainly from the uh, second half of the next decade. Uh, however, uh, we still believe that there is the uh, implementation implementation gaps between the declared target, no matter in Europe, US, or Southeast Asia countries, and the rate of annual installation. I think to get there, we have so many barriers need to uh, resolve. Uh, first of all, uh, I think we need to looking at permitting and we need to looking at the uh, market design in terms of auction system. And of course, without the supply chain, we cannot build anything. Uh, out in the water and uh, compared with the thick, uh, with unsure wind, we have the much longer list of balance of plan. Again, how we're going to build it and what we need to do together as an industry. I'm going to stop here and hand it over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca. She's going to bring the story part of the report and focus on the challenge I just highlighted here. Thank you. Over to you, Joyce. Great, thank you so much, Feng, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation of the market data within this report. I think this is just a snapshot of the uh, market intelligence from GWEC that we do provide in this report. So please do make sure that you visit the GWEC website and download the report. Uh, with that, I will hand it now to my colleague, Rebecca Williams, the Global Head of Offshore Wind at GWEC, one of the lead authors of this report, to go through more of the narrative side of what we're seeing in the offshore wind sector. Rebecca, the floor is yours. 
Thanks so much, Joyce, and thanks, Fung, for the fantastic overview there of the data. So I'm now going to take you through the what we're calling the story part of the report. I'm going to take you through our key policy recommendations and also the challenges uh, and opportunities as we see it for the global offshore wind sector going forwards. Uh, so if we can turn to our first slide, please. Fantastic. So we've already heard from Ben and, and Fung and also Ulrich that actually what we're seeing now is that more and more countries around the world are really wanting to take forward the offshore wind opportunity. There's actually no shortage of ambition now. Uh, it's certainly when we're looking at the targets that have been set. And we already heard about Europe's revision to its offshore wind targets. You can see that here on the slide. But we're also seeing globally a desire to increase offshore wind targets, engage in the offshore wind sector, or even set an offshore wind target for the first time. So on targets alone, we are creeping towards this 380 gigawatts, which is set out in the IRENA and GWEC UN Energy Compact as a target for the global offshore wind sector. And we estimate we're going to get to about 370 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2031. We still got to get to 2000 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. Uh, so there is still a long way to go. And at the moment, uh, only really China has shown itself capable of deploying at an annual rate, which is consistent with that target. So I want to leave you with a sense here of the ambition. But as has already been stated, ambition alone is not enough to, to realize uh, our shared focus of, of offshore wind around the world. What we need to see now is the action and the delivery, which is consummate with that ambition. So if we go on to the next slide, we will see that uh, we see that in this report that there's some key drivers of offshore wind growth in the global context. And you can see here that the, the focus of those drivers is around long-term policy and uh, long-term and stable policies, including different levels of support between governments and federal states, uh, visibility over the pipeline for offshore wind, well-resourced institutions and effective marine spatial planning and environmental social impact assessments, the role of grid infrastructure planning and port reinforcement, a competitive environment for offshore wind, and then a transparent and streamlined stakeholder process. And the report is set out into a few key sections. So our first section, and if we can go to the next slide, uh, focuses actually, sorry, this is, is uh, slightly out of order, but the first section actually focuses on the supply chain elements uh, of this question. So um, in the report, we focus in on the, the key challenges that we see uh, from the global supply chain for offshore wind. And the first one is the, the need to ensure the overall health of the offshore wind industry supply chain. And Fung in his comments already touched on this, but we do see significant headwinds for the global supply chain resulting from uh, an increased uh, commodity price prices globally um, and also increased inflation, which is associated with that trend. So we see those as, as major challenges, not just in the offshore wind sector, of course, but, but globally across different sectors. I suppose the difference with the offshore wind industry is that currently contracting procedures and policies are not necessarily set up to deal with that change. The other um, key, key challenge we see from a supply chain point of view is that on the supply side, uh, sorry, on the demand side, we see ever rising demand for, for offshore wind. Indeed, um, this year has been, <laughs> has been really exciting in terms of the number of countries that are coming forward, as I said, with a desire to set up an offshore wind industry in their country. And over the last few months even, we've, we've had some new players really come into, into the market um, and, and position themselves or try to position themselves as key offshore wind nations. So essentially we're seeing the demand drastically increase, but because of the headwinds that are being faced by the global supply chain, uh, we, we do see challenges perhaps in the future in meeting that demand uh, with supply unless policy instruments and governments work with industry to try and come up with solutions to this challenge. Uh, and the report floats a few different solutions that could be possible in this area. We note the role of taxation policy, and we also note the role of um, non-price factors or non-price criteria in different auctions. But as a collective, as, as industry and government together, we really need to have a, an honest conversation about this challenge and about how we can ensure 
the health of supply chains going forward, not just from an industry perspective, but also because as we know, offshore wind manufacturing is now um, supporting many jobs, uh, especially in Europe at this moment, but set to support many more in the Asian markets going forward. So it's definitely a need for uh, government intervention in this space too. Then the next challenge that the report focuses in on is really the role of these different policy frameworks. And we've, we've already heard um, my colleagues talk about the role of leasing uh, and permitting for, for offshore wind as a key driver of the future success of the industry. And in this slide here, we're just pausing on leasing for a, for a second. But the other global trend that we're seeing is a real overheating of, of leasing, of the leasing market for, for seabed. And that's due to a number of reasons, but we can see in uh, the Crown Estate round four leasing round and also then in the, the recent New York Bites auction run by Bowen, that uh, very high prices were achieved for, for rental prices in these, in these auctions. And actually we think that this is due to an artificial constraint on the amount of seabed which is being awarded. And actually when you look at this uh, from a policy point of view, um, if we are uh, saying that we need these vast volumes of offshore wind to, to meet the climate crisis, to meet net zero, and to help countries deliver on their own targets, and at the same time we're seeing the energy crisis with, with rising pressure, pressure on consumers' bills, it really, I think, uh, doesn't make very much sense to be constraining uh, leasing rounds in such an artificial way. So the way that we propose in the report to deal with this is to have a much greater um, alignment between uh, climate targets, offshore wind targets, and then leasing um, to enable more supply of leases to come to the market and um, remove, uh, remove this overheating trend that we are seeing here. If we go into the next slide, please. Our focus moves to permitting, obviously a related issue. But uh, analysis that we've done here at GWEC using uh, both GWEC data and also some Renewable UK data shows that the average uh, time, lead time for, for leasing at the moment from an off offshore wind project to come from lease to full commissioning is around nine years. And that just can't happen going forwards. We don't have the time to wait for, for nine years in order to get offshore wind into some of these key global growth markets. So there is a global need to create a more streamlined uh, permitting process and remove these bottlenecks. And actually we're seeing now that in uh, particularly in Europe, great strides are now being taken to address this challenge. We think that there's a lot of positive momentum there. Um, but we, we really would advise governments to look at permitting, look at how it can be simplified uh, and urgently address this because we do see this at the moment as a key blocker of, of the speed of acceleration of further growth of offshore wind. Next slide, please. And so in the report, we do focus on some key actions to streamline the permitting process. So we're talking here in the report around maximum lead time being mandated to permit plants. And already in Germany, this is a very active topic of conversation. We think that there is some good work being done there that could perhaps be emulated. Um, we also recommend having a single centralized authority and point of focus to work with renewable developers, the one-stop shop model, if you're familiar with that. What we've also seen so far is a real lack of resources, both in terms of digital resources, so how can we make sure that the permitting process is fully digitized, but also in terms of the different authorities uh, that, and stakeholders that are involved in the offshore wind pro process if, with regard to permitting. We feel that uh, making these uh, organizations and digital forums more well-resourced could have a huge impact in terms of uh, accelerating the permitting of offshore wind. As we mentioned, um, there, needs, there needs to be an alignment of land and ocean use guidance at both national and subnational level. And we do believe that there should be a prioritization of offshore wind projects because of offshore wind's unique role in helping to uh, mitigate carbon emissions and solve the climate crisis. We also see the role of promoting active dialogues between local authorities, community and industry to really get a shared discussion going around consenting and construction stages of wind projects. And then we also recommend implementing an emergency clearinghouse mechanism for legal disputes uh, to avoid protracted delays. So I think that's the, the last slide in this section and um, because the, the other focus of the report is all about the interrelationship between offshore wind, biodiversity 
uh, and how offshore wind can become a good custodian of the seabed. And the, the future speakers will take us through that section in some detail. So I'll leave it there and hand back to Joyce. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca, for, for the excellent presentation on uh, many of the, the critical factors that will take us into our, our next horizon for offshore wind growth. So I'll, I'll ask Rebecca to remain on our virtual stage. And I'll also be asking our other panelists to join us with, by turning their cameras on. Um, so just to welcome to the panel, we have Ben Sykes, Vice President of Offshore Wind at Orsted. We have Matthew Watkins, Principal Analyst at CREW. And we also have Martha Selwyn, Manager at the United Nations Global Compact or UNGC. Just checking that they're all with us. Hi, great to, great to see you all. Some of you joining from Lisbon, uh, some, some from abroad, I think, um, in the UK and other places. And I thought we could just kick off the panel um, by, by acknowledging the, the role of offshore wind, the profile of off, offshore wind at the UN Ocean Conference. So maybe Rebecca, this is a good one um, for you because you're on site. Uh, you, you have a physical launch uh, yesterday of the Global Offshore Wind Report with the UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, uh, the Danish Climate Ambassador uh, and speaker from Orsted and others. What are the initial reflections from the conversation on offshore wind at the conference? And what are the key action areas being called for by, by the UN and, and UN delegates, which may impact the growth for offshore wind? Yeah, great question, Joyce. And I'm sure um, both Martha and Ben, who are here at the conference uh, with me, will want to input into this conversation too. But I think the, the one key takeaway that I'm seeing is that we really need to bring this conversation around ocean sustainability and ocean health together with a conversation around climate change. I do feel that at the moment, those two things are quite siloed. And that's not good for, for offshore wind because we're operating in both these spheres where we're really putting forward our impacts in mitigating climate change. But at the same time, we, we want to really showcase our role in providing ocean sustainability, work with other ocean-based stakeholders, and ensure that we have a harmonious coexistence with other users of the seabed. So I think uh, we need to do much more and, and really bring the conversation together around this climate ocean nexus. I think a great way to do that, and we, we've already got some of the tools laid out here in the report, is to focus on things like marine spatial planning and the role of bringing these stakeholders together for a, for a you know, targeted um, implementation plan of how we better use and coordinate our use of the seabed. Great, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. And maybe um, I can pivot to Benj now. Uh, feel free to comment on that last question about offshore wind at UNOC, but I also wanted to ask you about some of the policy solutions which are, are forwarded in this report. Rebecca reviewed uh, a few of them around permitting and uh, supply chain in her presentation. In your view, sitting with Orsted, uh, leading developer of offshore wind globally, what are the policy solutions that, that uh, your company is, is trying to promote to really start to translate some of these market ambitions into realistic growth pathways. Yeah, so just quickly on the UN Oceans Conference, it, it's absolutely clear that we need to up our game. It's great to be here with GWEC uh, in this conversation to make sure that offshore wind is seen as a solution, not just in the usual bubble that we exist in, which is climate change uh, and affordable clean energy, but also around ocean sustainability. It will give us the mandate to build those 2000 gigawatts uh, that has already been mentioned. So it's a really big question, uh, Joyce, about what, what policy levers we need to see. Uh, and to be honest, I think uh, Rebecca has, has brought them out really neatly. You know, we don't see enough action coming through in terms of making seabed available, in terms of providing volume of route to market. Um, but I, I, I probably want to focus on one specific point here, which is around how we um, provide what is needed in the offshore from the offshore wind sector to governments and, and I guess the societies that they represent. And we, I've mentioned ocean health and biodiversity is clearly going to be an enabler of more growth. But um, I think we need to be having more of a conversation with policymakers around what they really want because we, we seem to have got, the record seems to have got stuck on cost reduction. So all policy seems to be driving us towards that last cent per megawatt hour of, of cost reduction, when actually that's really not what uh, politicians and governments should be chasing right now. Policy should be framed around a much broader context. 
uh, we've already heard about the squeeze in the supply chain. There is an immense ask. If I look at all those graphs that uh, Fong showed earlier, there's a massive uptick conveniently just in the future. Um, and that can only happen if supply chain companies become more investable for investors. And I think what we need to see is a pivot from a race to the bottom on cost to a race to the top on some of the other issues, biodiversity, but also making sure that we have a financially as well as a biologically sustainable supply chain. So I think that policy pivot for me is absolutely crucial. Um, and, you know, we're having that conversation in different markets because we see we're probably chasing yesterday's prize, not today's. Thanks so much, Benj. And, and let's take a few minutes to dive deeper into this uh, this issue of cost reduction, the, the so-called race to the bottom on cost that the sector um, finds itself in. And uh, let's look at some of the, the causes of uh, inflationary impacts over the last year and a half. So maybe Matthew, turning to you with crew as, as a commodities expert, um, your case study in the report examined some of the challenges around materials for offshore wind growth. Can you tell us a bit about a few examples of materials supply bottlenecks which are impacting the industry at the moment and what sort of mitigation uh, from crew's perspective could be undertaken to reduce those uh, materials bottlenecks ahead? Thanks Joyce. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. I mean, it, you know, we've heard a lot here about the, the sort of very rapid pace of installing capacity, certainly what needs to be done you know, to, to add more and more capacity. So, you know, like from a, from a materials supplier perspective, that's a very strong demand pipeline going forward. And then, and of course, you know, that, that can quite easily, you can see how that can result in, in sort of supply bottlenecks for all sorts of things to try and meet that demand. Um, I guess a couple of things that we might, that we might think of in that area. I mean, one that we see at the moment is in, in, uh, in subsea cables, for example. I mean, you need cables to, export the electricity that's produced. Um, these are kind of quite high value, fairly specialist things that are not produced by very many uh, producers around the world. Um, so I guess, you know, there's, there's a limited number of producers of these things. There are fairly high barriers to entry in terms of technical requirements, capital investments, those sorts of things. You know, and we're hearing things like a five year lead time, for example, if you want to put in an order for these things in Europe now, which which is a pretty long time. I think that would that would probably count as a as a bottleneck. Um arguably another one I could I could think of is is a bit more close to my heart, I suppose. I mean I, I tend to focus a lot on steel. Um low CO2 steel is is something that the offshore wind industry is going to need. If, it's, if it itself is going to be truly decarbonized in the future. You know, it can deliver low carbon electricity, but it does it by, by making a lot of things out of steel. So if we can make that steel low CO2, um, I think that will be a strong pipeline of demand. Today, it's not that easy to make large quantities of low CO2 steel, and especially in the kind of steel that we're using in offshore wind. Um, you know, most plate, which is the kind of steel you make monopiles out of, um, is made from a blast furnace and it takes you know nearly two and a half tons of CO2 for each ton of plate that you make out of that so that that's something that I think is going to going to become potentially a bottleneck in the future in terms of mitigation strategies um, I guess ultimately you know it's about trying to encourage more supply to the market right um, sounds simple it's quite difficult to do it's a long-term solution um, with with many steps I mean some of those can be quite Collaborative. I think early engagement with suppliers is 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 obviously a, a key here. It might happen anyway if you're having to wait five years to supply your cables, so you, you have to um, engage early. But you know, demonstrating that there is that kind of clear, reliable, um, you know, path to market, market opportunity, whatever you want to call it, for the supplier there. Um, that can run into sort of partnership things. You know, maybe we're talking about joint research and development, maybe even joint investments in, in additional capacity, those kinds of things. You know, we are seeing a number of arrangements and partnerships start to take off between, for example, steel mills and energy companies in Europe, and those, those sorts of things are starting to happen. One final thing, I guess, on that as a, as a sort of an opposite approach, and maybe a less collaborative approach in terms of mitigation, but we can also think about substitution, you know, and maybe that's substitution of suppliers, so encouraging different suppliers, alternate suppliers into the market. Uh, maybe that's one. 
maybe in the end also substitutability of product. Is it possible to find a different product that can do the same job? You know, as I say, that's very much less of a partnership and quite in, in, in potentially quite a combative sort of approach. Um, but maybe, you know, there are, there are some areas where that also warrants uh, an investigation as an option. Great, thanks very much, Matthew. Uh, really interesting answer. So scope for risk mitigation, scope for uh, further investment and in innovation, research and development, as well as perhaps um, collaboration between suppliers in the supply chain between OEMs. I, I think this is becoming a, a bigger topic in the last few months as well. Uh, so I would like to, I would like to come back to the supply chain issue because I know we're getting lots of questions in the Q&A around rare earth elements, around supply chain capacity, so the actual manufacturing activity um, ramping up to meet market ambitions. But first, let's turn to one of the other key themes in this report, which is sustainability from the perspective of environmental protection and um, preservation of marine biodiversity. So Martha, I'm turning to you in a, in a different corner of UNOC, I think, than, than Benj finds himself in at the moment. Um, let's, let's hear a little bit uh, from your perspective on this focus on sustainability because the UN Global Compact has for the second year in a row contributed um, very kindly to the Global Offshore Wind Report uh, with uh, some, some content on this topic. Can you speak about how marine spatial planning has evolved to integrate these expanding ambitions for offshore wind into the ocean space? How, how is offshore wind as an industry interfacing with other ocean users and sectors? And is that, are these tensions, uh, the, the tensions and let's say opportunity for, for cooperation, is that getting enough recognition from governments? Thank you so much, Joyce. And yes, I am reporting from a slightly louder corner from the UN Ocean Conference and Bench, so apologies for this. Um, so I think I want to sort of first take a step back and maybe just sort of talk about also some of the key messages that are coming out of this conference, which will have relevance, obviously, to, to the question that you posed. And I think what is very clear here in Lisbon is that everyone agrees that the oceans are getting increasingly busy. And that's really important. And we're talking increasingly busy and they need to get busier in terms of actually meeting some of the blue economy goals in terms of more aquaculture, sustainable fisheries, also marine protected areas. So we're talking about a busier ocean, um, but we're also talking then um, about a need to then ensure that that busier ocean is also prioritizing areas of the ocean space that are needed for climate mitigation and, and other sustainability goals. So I think what we're seeing is that uh, governments are, are looking and, and recognizing the need to, to prioritize more areas of the ocean space. We see more countries that are developing marine spatial plans. I think we have 70 countries now in total that are developing marine spatial plans to support this. Um, but actually, um, only 10 of them are government approved. Um, and only uh, seven of them have actually been updated and adapted. So once again, there's a, their plans are being developed. Uh, but not necessarily then also being implemented and then updated and adapted. Um, but what's good and what's important is that we are seeing high level political recognition for the need of this. Um, one, one example of this is, for instance, the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, which will now have 17 heads of state, including the UK, which is soon to join. But France and the USA have also um, signed up. And what this basically means is you have a head of state level government leaders who are um, saying that sustainable ocean management and how we use our oceans is important. I think um, this really deserves some attention. But as said, the implementation of the strategic marine spatial plan um, is lagging. And as Rebecca pointed out, um, there's still a bit of a disconnect between ocean and climate in these plans. And what I would disagree with potentially is that I think we are seeing more recognition for nature-based solutions, blue carbon ecosystems, and protecting seaweeds and seagrasses when it comes to marine spatial planning. But offshore wind somehow hasn't quite made it into the climate mitigation box. We're all talking more about ocean climate in terms of, as I said, NBS or nature-based solutions and ecosystems, but the offshore wind part is somehow not quite there yet. So that's something that we need to work on and we need to talk more about offshore wind as a climate solution within this ocean conversation so that it actually has a prioritization and that is needed within these plans. Um, so I think what's important, um, two additional things I wanted to say is that, of course, it's recognized, and I'm sure everyone here on this in this webinar understands why marine spatial planning is important for offshore wind, because it obviously provides that space to facilitate the conversations that are needed to discuss some trade-offs that we're going to have to make between some of our ocean users. Um, and also, of course, importantly, moving a little bit beyond trade-offs and conflicts, but 
finding um, ways to actually identify synergies between ocean users and how can we actually talk more about partnerships and combining offshore wind with nature rather than always talking about addressing conflict. So I think that's important that we recognize how important marine spatial planning is to facilitate that process, facilitate what we were talking about, about social acceptance, social buy-in for these projects. But I wanted to reverse it also slightly because how I see it here, and if we're talking about, you know, back to the question about what offshore wind can do in terms of its sustainability goals, I really see potential here of offshore wind being a leader to actually galvanize marine spatial planning more broadly. So rather than saying, okay, MSP is a lever for offshore wind, how can offshore wind be a lever for MSP? How can offshore wind actually support sustainable ocean management? And you see in markets like the US, where actually the Rhode Island Marine Spatial Plan was triggered by offshore wind. So how can offshore wind also lead in these conversations about you know, saying that we need an ocean which is actually prioritizing its use of space and how can offshore wind sort of, as said, be, be a leader in its sustainability goals by actually acknowledging that it cannot come at any cost and that we should be talking more about um, how it fits into to a broader ocean space. So th those would be my thoughts here. Thanks so much, Martha. And I think a good call to action uh, to industry as well to, to take a leadership role in supporting governments in these marine spatial planning processes. And I think also a, a vote of confidence that we're seeing more governments um, start to make commitments and recognize the importance of MSP. Although, as you said, uh, similar to, to high level net zero targets, the actual implementation frameworks, the, the how and the what um, to get to those targets is, is still a bit murky. Um, so let's come back to this topic around sustainability and biodiversity in a second. I'd like to go back to Rebecca um, on the policy side and, and maybe a few of the policy solutions in the report that we haven't yet been able to cover in this discussion. I do see there's a question from an audience member on stringent localization demands of offshore supply chains, especially in emerging markets or what this audience member calls an immature market. And they're, they're looking at Taiwan's upcoming round three auction um, as an example of uh, this tension between local content and a supply chain that hasn't yet had the time to bet in or the investment um, uh, horizon to bet in. So maybe Rebecca turning to you on some of the, the other policy solutions around either localization or auction seabed leasing. Um, talk us through a few of these, these kinds of growth enablers. Yeah, thanks Joyce, great question. And Certainly local content rules are a very hot topic of, of discussion in the industry at the moment. I think we are seeing a global trend as governments really want to carve out an industrial strategy around offshore wind for themselves. And so as a result, we are seeing a greater desire to really um, implement more stringent local content rules and requirements or to kind of push um, supply chain development and local content in, in their auction and, and sometimes leasing strategies. Um, I think the thing to say there, and particularly with, with regard to emerging markets, is emerging markets really need to think carefully about how they get that balance right between uh, LCOE cost reduction and the establishment um, of a healthy supply chain in, in their area. And I think um, the, the Benj really nicely articulated this challenge that we face now with reframing the debate. So it's not just one around LCOE and a kind of race to the bottom on cost. I think if, if governments really want to, to have a very strong local content agenda or a strong supply chain development agenda, you know, they, they, they really need to have their expectations set then about what kind of LCOE could be achieved. I would also say that kind of putting these elements in place before you've managed to put in other elements of, of policy and the framework around offshore wind can actually make it very difficult now and impossible to achieve these stringent local content rules because if you don't have an industry developed if you don't have a developed supply chain in the first place it's very diff difficult to to use that local supply chain on the ground as as we'll all be aware of the other thing I would highlight is the role of kind of regional cooperation in building regional hubs for supply chain growth. I think there's a, that's, that's a great topic of conversation and one that we should explore more in future reports around how we can uh, leverage regional hubs for supply chain growth. And we see that being very successfully used as a potential model in, in many of the emerging Asian, Asian markets that we are working with right now. So, so I think that's something that, that should receive a, a strong focus. 
Um, just to kind of loop back again on, on the question around then um, local content rules or, or non-price criteria, I do think there are different ways of, of trying to address this apparent tension between kind of cost and, and what governments expect in terms of supply chain growth. And actually, I think there are some quite good ways of, of doing this where non-price factors could be used in auctions in, in a useful way to try and drive that growth. Uh, of supply chain, but I think that that needs to be done carefully and, and needs to have a kind of holistic view of the different levers and push and pull factors. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And I think there's there's clearly a strong theme around uh, a healthy supply chain, uh, long time horizons for investment and procurement, which are emerging here. Um, so let's let's just uh, dwell on this topic for a second. And we have a, a question from a very good friend of the offshore wind industry asking about the key bottlenecks to deliver these massive, uh, he says megawatts, but really it's it's gigawatts uh, for the supply chain, including OEMs for turbines, towers, cables, ships, and so on to invest. Do we believe they can deliver? If not, what needs to change? And I'd like to turn to um, Benj, if that's okay, uh, from, from this um, perspective as, as a developer, although this is a supply chain question, I think- the Yeah. You're in the value chain as, as much. We are. We're we're in there, and, and and actually, my answer will probably be what I said earlier that the um, the race to the bottom on price is starving all the way down the supply chain. It's a massive squeeze on developers, which means that squeeze goes right down through the supply chain. So I think that's one thing. Is is uh, and as others have already said, Rebecca just mentioned, if people, you know, if governments want supply chains, then that comes with a cost. It also comes with a big social benefit and we haven't talked much about you know people in the in the context of what we're trying to achieve here um, but people and communities are at the core of uh, what we need to focus on because that is what politicians focus on and therefore what policy makers focus on so let's not forget about that and i think you know, one big lever is to uh, get around um, this problem of uh, being too successful on price discovery uh, and driving uh, sustainable returns out of the supply chain so that's one thing which will encourage more investment in the supply chain. I suppose the other is uh, on the local content point, making sure that we are working with governments to help them understand what good looks like in the supply chain. You know, different markets will be good at different things. Different places will excel globally in different elements of the supply chain. Let's help them understand which horses to put their money on and which horses not to put their money on so that we don't end up with uncompetitive supply chains. Um, and, and of course, you know, building new supply chains means extra cost. There's no doubt that any new factory, any new facility, any new infrastructure um, has teething challenges, has a slow ramp up rate, and that adds cost. So again, we need to figure out how to shape policy that will encourage those kind of facilities to get built, those kind of factories to get built. Uh, because um, when there are existing factories that are already squeezed, to, uh, paired to the bone on cost, it's very difficult to set up a new facility and carry the additional cost burden through the first few years. Yeah. It's it's becoming clear that cooperation is going to be a, a principle of finding our way out of this supply chain, these supply chain challenges, and that goes to both um, cooperation between industry and governments, uh, which have these uh, local content or price considerations, but also cooperation within the industry, within the supply chain players themselves. So let's let's turn to you, Matthew, on on your thoughts on this. Uh, the the risk mitigation mechanisms that what can the industry do to change uh, to, to try to resolve some of these challenges and sustain a more healthy supply chain. Um, there's a lot of discussion around a redistribution of value, for instance, along smaller suppliers, OEMs and developers, so along the value chain, or perhaps new contracting uh, price hedging structures. Um, what are what are you seeing as as the the, the methods to to resolve supply chain squeezes? Um, yeah, it's a big area, um, I, and I guess it sort of runs into, you know, what, what's what's a pretty big global topic these days anyway. If we think about inflation, you know, I mean, God, even as an individual, you know, the price of everything is going up, uh, but inflation, it's you know, it's, it's it's a big deal for for the industrial businesses as well. Um, Actually, I guess the two can sort of coincide if we think about the possibility that government puts on price caps on energy to shield consumers, and then that limits the revenue that renewable energy assets can can generate and so on. But but yeah, you know, in terms of squeezes on supply chains, a lot of that inflation has has come from, for example, higher commodity prices, higher commodity costs. 
Um, and then, you know, that, that sort of feeds through in, in, in terms of uh, the different players at different stages having having to deal with with much higher input costs and, and a challenge of sort of well how do you how do you pass that through maybe if you've fixed your selling price but your input costs go up that that becomes quite a challenge actually i i, I think you know from the perspective of a commodities analyst it, it the problem is maybe not so much that prices have gone up i mean if, if prices go up and just stay up and they're, they're high forever eventually you can you can pass those through it's more that they're volatile and volatility in commodities prices is, is, you know, is a thing. Commodities markets are volatile by nature. The price goes up and it goes down. And so managing that volatility is really the key, I think, rather than necessarily just that prices have in this cycle gone up. You know, if we think, again, I'm going to talk about steel. Uh -huh. um, but if we think about the price of steel in the last couple of years, you know, in Germany, the price of plate, which is what you make monopiles out of, that's there was there was like a three times difference between the lowest price and the highest price um, since last January, so 18 months or so. So, you know, if you put in an order of 10,000 tons or tens of thousands of tons, let's say, of steel at the low price point, you know, great, you make a massive opportunity gain. Everybody's happy. But, you know, timing the market like that is is a challenge and you know you could very easily put in the, the the order at a point when the price is high um and then you know the, the outcome is very different i think what we're seeing a lot more of now is um linking the price making it a a, a sort of a dynamic price linking it to an index so that you pay something that goes up and it goes down um over time with the market it's a fair representation of what the value is of that in this case steel but but you know can be other other items that are being bought and sold so the distribution between buyer and seller becomes much more equitable it's not a question of one person gets their market timing right and they win and the other person loses it's much more much more win-win um in terms of the mechanism i mean it's a little bit of a flag wave but okay you know cru discovers steel prices for example we're seeing a lot of the the, the offshore wind chain chooses to index steel uh purchases to CRU steel prices you know we're, we're happy about that but I mean more seriously it, it does provide a mechanism to to distribute that value more fairly between the buyer and seller it can move the focus of those discussions away from price let's face it price is often a kind of a what's a, a source of friction let's say if you're talking about price you can discuss other things rather than what the hell the price should be of this thing so I think there are tools out there that can that can kind of help with that uh, with that problem. Thanks so much, Matthew. Those, those are some great concrete examples of uh, the kinds of stabilization mechanisms, hedging mechanisms, uh, redistribution, which are being discussed by, by industry actors today. And um, we are rapidly running out of time, and, and that's a shame because this has been a really great discussion so far, but we do have time uh, to go to Martha for, for one last question. I know she's getting a lot of questions about um, biodiversity and MSP in the panel. Um, so Martha, it, it was a fantastic example you shared about Rhode Island and offshore wind initiating uh, a, a state-driven MSP practice and process. Um, what are some other examples of uh, what has been termed climate smart MSP practices which are coming out of the industry uh, whether that it touches on data sharing, um, that has been asked about in the Q&A panel, ocean signs, conflict reduction, um, and what needs to happen in your perspective on a greater scale to ensure um, more sustainable growth from the industry. Thank you. Um, so I think just firstly, when we say climate smart marine spatial planning, I think this concept which we're really trying to champion at UN Global Compact is a is a framework to bridge these conversations that we're having around ocean and climate and as a framework to make sure that, that these conversations are being joined up and I think for me that means on the one hand actually the prioritization of ocean space for climate mitigation which includes offshore wind but of course also as some of these blue carbon ecosystems and nature restoration that we've been talking about but as Benj quite rightly points out this is also a social dimension and climate smart marine spatial planning is systems thinking marine spatial planning so it's also talking about things like how can we embed climate literacy more into stakeholder engagement processes and that are led under um, the marine spatial planning process so in terms of what sort of industry is already doing to support this I think on the one hand we're talking about multi-use and we're talking about companies that are already identifying ways that they can be synergistic with nature 
Here we're talking things like nature inclusive designs, um, but also identifying areas of which they can uh, support to sort of restore areas um, of the ocean space. Um, and here I want to add that policy is really important here. And of course, this comes through a marine spatial plan also, because we see, for instance, in the Netherlands, that there have been specific areas of the North Sea that have been designated to trying multi-use and trying different constellations between offshore wind, nature, and also sustainable seafood production. So I think here what's important is using marine spatial planning to also enable industry to be creative and to um, lead on some of these sort of uh, more nature inclusive and uh, multi use um, infrastructures. In terms of data and science, and I'm really glad that question has been asked because we've been discussing it throughout this week. And I think the question, firstly, also here is what data? And that's a bit of the sort of thing that we've been discussing this week because not all data is useful. Some of it is useful. And I think what we need from policy and what we need from planners is also a clearer indication what data they would need from offshore wind and how it would then in turn also be applied in marine spatial planning. And that's some of the work that we've also been doing at UN Global Compact, sort of working with some of our industry partners to really take a look at what kind of data is being collected and then in turn connecting that to planners. So how could they use that data? And I think before we have that conversation, um, it's a bit tricky to sort of um, discuss um, that, that sort of next step. So firstly, what data is needed and then where can it be shared? So for instance, of course, Global Ocean Observing System is a really useful framework here, but I think that first step is firstly discussing the applicability and then finding the appropriate place to share that data. In terms of what's needed, and I think this always seems to be the thing that everyone says at the end of these webinars, but it really is collaboration and it really is collaboration between a wide range of stakeholders and here, of course, collaboration within the marine spatial planning process is important. And I think we can't forget how lucky we are sometimes that we do have a process that enables public consultation on how we are going to use the future of the ocean space and we're lucky to have an existing process, but there's also certainly room for more informal spaces where stakeholders can discuss. And I think sometimes what has been criticized about marine spatial planning is it can be a bit of a box ticking exercise and doesn't actually give the space for stakeholders to come together and talk more about synergies rather than always addressing conflicts. So how can governments within their marine spatial planning policy and within their strategic ocean policy also make space for communities of practice or make space for these conversations that are so desperately needed between offshore wind but also other users of the marine space. So I think that would be my sort of my sort of key ask for NGOs but also so mainly to governments to sort of support the facilitation of spaces and um, to have some of uh, these discussions. Thanks so much, Martha. And in that spirit, I'll highlight uh, on behalf of the UNGC, the Ocean Stewardship Coalition, uh, which I know you and your colleagues are leading and has created uh, such a, a space uh, for discussion across different ocean users and different constituencies. Um, so that's the Ocean Stewardship Coalition uh, for, for those who are interested in uh, learning more about that. So we're just about at time, but I would like to get one last parting shot question in uh, around the panel. And I'll ask for a uh, kind of lightning 30 second responses here. Um, so it's 2023, we've come back for the webinar uh, launching the Global Offshore Wind Report 2023. Um, what would be the one action that you would have liked to see uh, you know, from here until the next year? Um, that could really help to get the industry on a more net zero compatible pathway and on a pathway for sustainable growth. So just keeping it to one, we know it's not only one, um, but if you could call for one, what would it be? Um, I'll start uh, with Rebecca and then we'll go to Benj, Matthew and back to Martha. Leasing aligned with offshore wind targets. Period. I like it. <laughs> Very concise. Thank you. So since I'm uh, here at the UN conference, I'm going to go to 100,000 feet and say that we finally get offshore wind at the centre of both sustainable sustainability and climate change conversations so that we can drive faster action uh, with a bigger bunch of supporters. Great. Thanks, Ben. Matthew? Um, I'm going to go from the materials angle again, I guess. Uh, I, I think it would be uh, a clear demonstration that there is a long-term sustainable opportunity in decarbonized material supply. So to make sure that we've got those sort of you know, net zero scope three emissions for the industry. Great. Martha? Yeah, I would tend to agree with Bench there. I think if we've placed offshore wind firmly within the ocean climate nexus, and then in turn also enabled that ocean climate nexus to be firmly within marine spatial planning and strategic allocation, I think that would be a success. 
Fantastic. Uh, I think this really speaks to the diversity of expertise and, and domain uh, experts that we have on our panel today. That, that was um, quite a few action areas to work on over the next year, um, but the industry is, is ready and willing to do this. And I think we had a great discussion today around the need for cooperation and collaboration, uh, the need for greater uh, engagement between governments and industry on some of these market realities, um, supply chain cooperation versus uh, competition as, as the impulse. Now we need to really work together to um, meet uh, accelerated growth pathways and looking ahead at, at some of the, uh, the externalities affecting the industry, uh, commodity price volatility, decarbonization commitments um, from different users along the value chain. Um, these are all adding complexities uh, to what we're calling the, the next horizon for offshore wind growth. So I would uh, give a final note of great appreciation to our panelists. Um, they've been very busy behind the scenes while, while I've been firing questions at them. We've answered more than 16 questions uh, in the Q&A panel. So uh, a, a very big thank you to, to them for providing their time and their energy to this webinar today. Another thank you to our sponsors of the Global Offshore Wind Report. Please visit uh, the GWEC website, download it. It's, it's free and uh, you can contact the GWEC team at any time if you have any, any follow-up questions or, or clarifications on what we've discussed today. So thank you again and wishing you all a great rest of the day and a final day of the UN, UN Ocean Conference for those of you in Lisbon.